Why, O Lord, do the nations rage? Why do the peoples meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against you, Yahweh, and against your anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. You sit in the heavens and laugh. You mock them. Then you speak in your anger and terrify them in your fury, saying, as for me, I install my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to the son, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. The ends of the earth is your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and shatter them like a potter's vessel. We pray, O Lord, that the kings of the earth would show insight, take warning, and serve you with fear and rejoice with trembling. May they kiss the sun, lest the sun become angry and they perish in the way. We know, Lord, that your wrath will soon be kindled. And how blessed are all who take refuge in you. We ask now as we look at your word, that by your Holy Spirit, you would make hearts soft, that you would open eyes, that you would give us a yieldedness to you. And we pray that we in our very hearts would tremble before you, honor you in Jesus name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 14. We will begin our time this morning simply by reading the text before us. Revelation 14 verses 14 through 20. They are simply the next verses in our study. Then I looked, John writes, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the sanctuary, crying out with a loud voice to him who sits on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because of the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sits on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the sanctuary, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who had authority over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. This dramatic scene pictures the last judgment of God against the rebellious world of this age. God's final judgments of this rebellious world are likened to two harvests, a harvest of grain and a harvest of grapes. Nearly every commentator outlines this passage the same way. I will not break the mold, a grain harvest and a grape harvest. The grain harvest here in this text represents the bowl judgments, the final series of judgments from heaven against the earth dwellers during the tribulation. And the grape harvest represents the battle of Armageddon, the final war of this age, when Jesus himself will descend personally to defend Jerusalem, to annihilate the beast, the false prophet, and all of the world's assembled armies. These two judgments mark the last brief period of the rebellion of our age, perhaps only a few months long. A harvest is a fitting season. 
A harvest is a symbol of the end of a season. The season of cutting down, the season of the growth complete. The fruit of the earth is ripe. The owner of the land has come and its crop is ready to be claimed by the owner. Let's look at these two harvests. The first is a harvest of grain depicted in verses 14 through 16. Look at verse 14. John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. This has become a familiar refrain to us when John says, And I looked, and behold... This depicts for us a a new scene in the prophetic picture of the book of Revelation. And, And Jesus is the one described in this scene. He is seated on a cloud. He is like the son of man. He has a golden crown on his head and a sickle. And Jesus here in Revelation 14 is at the center of a series of angelic pronouncements. There are three angel announcements we looked at last week. There will be three to follow this scene And here Jesus is right in the middle. Jesus is right in the middle of this final judgment in chapter 14. And he is described as sitting on a white cloud. Jesus described his own return this way in numerous occasions. He said, you will see the son of man coming on the clouds. And here that is exactly what is depicted When he is titled, one like a son of man, this takes the phrase from Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, which was a a figure of deity before the throne of the father being commissioned to judge in the end times. Of course, son of man was introduced for us back in Revelation chapter 1 as a title for Jesus, identifying him as this very one. In Revelation 1.13, we read, He is in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. In that scene, Jesus was seen as being amongst the churches during the church age. And here in Revelation 14, as with Daniel 7, he is seen ready to take his seat on the throne of David to rule the nations. This is a fitting title for Jesus. He is called the Son of Man throughout the Gospels. It was his favorite term for himself. It doesn't just mean he was a son of men, like any male would be on this earth. For him to be called the Son of Man was a special designation. It is surprising that deity would take on flesh and therefore be called the Son of Man in a very unique way. It affirms his humanity. And with the definite article, it also affirms his deity. The first use of the title Son of Man comes in Matthew 8.20, where Jesus says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head on the earth. A remarkable introduction to that title for Messiah. And now here in Revelation 14, with the victor's crown on his head, he returns to reclaim the whole earth as rightfully his. He will have a place He is described here in verse 14 as having a golden crown on his head. The word for crown here is Stephanos. That is the crown of athletic victory or military victory. Later, he will have the diadem, the crown of royalty. And he is described in this verse as having a sharp sickle in his hand. We know the sickle from the cartoonish descriptions of the grim reaper. Even the image of the Grim grim Reaper comes from this chapter and this very scene, although we wouldn't describe Jesus anywhere remotely the way that is depicted. But you've seen the long pole and the long curved blade, and it was designed to be held with both hands outstretched on this long pole and swung back and forth at ground level to chop off standing grain at the ground. This is a farming implement. Very effective one designed to mow down standing stalks of grain. It was in Russia in 2001 and we watched the lawnmowers, the the people holding sickles, cutting down four foot high swaths of grass 
overgrown. And very deftly, they would swing these sickles back and forth and level the grass flat close to the ground. That is the picture here. And strikingly, humanity is to be mowed down by the reaper. Look at verse 15. Another angel came out of the sanctuary, crying out with a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Here we have another angel and this angel is in heaven. This angel comes out of the sanctuary and and the picture here is that prayer that the followers of Jesus have prayed. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's prescriptive will has not been done on earth all these 6,000 years by rebellious humanity. God will have his way. The earth will yield The answer to humanity's unrestrained rebellion will not come from the earth. Revelation 14 is not a picture of evolution of society, societal improvement, the upswing of human development. Things are not going to get better. In fact, the ripeness described here is the apex of its worseness. The answer to humanity's unrestrained rebellion will come from the sanctuary of God in heaven. And this angel cries out with a loud voice to Jesus. The angel in heaven makes the stunning announcement. It is harvest time. And he says, put in your sickle and reap. I want you to think for a moment about angels. They live in the place where God's glory is manifest. His Holiness is obvious. His radiant beauty shines out in unapproachable light. And they must look down on a world of rebellious humanity and wonder, when is God going to take care of this? You and I as sinners don't see sin that way. We don't naturally see the holiness of God or the justice of God that way. We aren't crying out at a world gone wrong. We tend to think, why do bad things happen to me? When in reality, good things have happened to you every day you've been on God's earth in your rebellion. The angels know it. The angels have been waiting for this moment. Consider the angels who never sinned. They had colleagues who sinned once and it was over with no hope. No rescue for fallen angels. These angels are elect angels, no doubt preserved in God's kindness for them. They didn't sin and they will never sin. It means they will never know what it is like to be redeemed. They will never know the glories of God and his multifaceted attributes of grace and mercy and patience and long suffering, except as third party witnesses. You can think about angels longing to look into the grace and the gospel that we sinners who have believed the gospel enjoy. And certainly they rejoice at one sinner who turns. But no doubt they rejoice when God takes his vengeance on a sea of humanity that will not turn. The angel says time is up. It's harvest season And appeals to Jesus to put in the sickle. He says, for the hour to reap has come. There are signs of the seasons. We're experiencing finally in Arizona, a change of the weather. With a change in the seasons, there is a change in the plant life. There is a change in the fruit. In an agricultural area, the The harvest time means a a ripening of fruit, readiness. And by this point in the tribulation period, there will have been many signs of the closing of that season. There have been the cataclysmic judgments from heaven, the seal judgments followed by the trumpet judgments, which will be followed by the bowl judgments, which unfold in the next chapters. One of the signs will have been the 144,000 sealed Jewish evangelists. Chased, 
making their way across the globe untouchable. There will have been the sign of the two witnesses who very publicly called down fire. They were murdered for all the world to see. Their bodies left for dead in the streets. And then they were raised from the dead and and then, then, then they ascended. There will also be the sign of the angel in mid heaven that proclaims an eternal gospel. Worldwide publication of a, of a last warning, a final warning, an invitation to mercy. There will be the fulfillment of the specifics of biblical prophecy. Those who will open their Bibles, that will read Matthew 24 and 25, that will read the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel or Zephaniah or Zechariah or any of the prophets. They will be able to know that it is the time. They will see very specifically world history following exactly as God has promised. In fact, from the point of the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist will go into the temple in Jerusalem, declare himself to be God and demand that everybody worship him on pain of death. From that point forward, you could mark your clocks. The countdown for the end of the season will be evident. Anybody reading the book could know what time it is. Human history up until that point will have been a time of mercy, a time of grace. The harvest at the end will be a time of reaping what has been sown. And he says, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. The angel uses this word ripe, and it's a word that indicates something being dry or withered. That is, the the grain is overripe. The, The fruit of the grain has gone too far to be useful for anything. It is rotten. For all of its potential, for all of the gracious sunshine and timely rains that the human race has received from above, the world has produced rotten fruit. At the time of this harvest, at humanity's full maturity, the landowner comes back to check the crop and finds that it is blighted rotten through and through. And look at verse 16. Then he who sits on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Jesus takes the sickle and swings it low and reaps the earth. The field of the earth is his. He has the authority and the ownership to harvest the grain. The picture is violent. Men and women here are pictured as grain standing in the field. Having grown up to be all that they could become, cut down in judgment. The statement the earth was reaped is so short. This simple statement closes out the picture of the first harvest. It's so short a sentence that brings to an end 6,000 years or more, whatever it will be at the time, of humanity's glory. This abrupt description will end humanity's new tower of Babel. That final emblem of mankind's greatness. The culmination of the beast's great boasts. The reaping depicted here are the last series of God's judgments against Babylon, the revived Roman Empire, the world system against apostate religion, and a world full of people who have rejected the gospel of grace in a vain attempt to live their own lives, their own ways, apart from God. The earth will suffer, and the creatures for whom the earth was made will suffer. In chapter 16, we get the list of those bold judgments which depict in sequential detail this reaping of Jesus from the cloud. First, loathsome and malignant sores on humanity, chapter 16, verse 2. Followed by all of the seas on the earth turning to blood completely. It had been partially done before and now totally all the sea water will be blood and every living thing in the sea will die. Chapter 16 verse 3. Followed by the rivers and the springs turned to blood. That is all the fresh water on the earth will be blood. Undrinkable. Chapter 16 verse 4. All of these things will, will bring to mind to humanity that... There is no hope. 
the water has run out. It's all gone bad. Followed in chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, by the sun itself going ballistic. The sun will scorch everyone with fire and fierce heat. Followed by darkness and pain in chapter 16, verse 10. The sixth bull judgment is the drying up of the Euphrates River, chapter 16, verse 12. Specifically for the purpose of making a corridor, a land corridor for massive armies to infiltrate the Holy Land. And then the last bull judgment will be the goat earthquake. The greatest of all time earthquake. Jerusalem as a city will be split apart. And all the cities of the earth will fall in that earthquake. That will not be a regional seismic activity. The globe will shake and bring all the buildings of man to crumbling heaps. This is the harvesting of the grain in chapter 14. Now, grain harvest is normally a happy occasion. Fall is a a happy turn, a a signal of bounty and prosperity, a time of celebration. But the grain of this harvest is bad fruit, overripe rebellion, the maturation of human wickedness, ready to be mowed down by the Lord of the earth. There is a second harvest. Begins in verse 17. Joel chapter 3 is interesting because in Joel chapter 3, that Old Testament prophet, Joel also describes these same two harvests. Two events with the same two metaphors, a a grain harvest and a grape harvest. Uh, What Revelation fills out some of the details of is the exact same storyline the Old Testament prophets predict. And we come to this second harvest, a harvest of grapes, beginning in verse 17. After these bold judgments accelerate in the final weeks or months of the great tribulation, the culmination of judgment of the world will take place when Jesus returns personally to the earth. In the first judgment harvest, he swung his sickle from a cloud. In this second judgment harvest, he will be on the ground. Look at verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. In the second harvest, an an angel carries the sickle rather than the Lord Jesus. Verse 18, another angel came out from the altar. What altar is described here in verse 18? I believe this is the altar in heaven. The only altar that's up there in the depiction of Revelation is the altar of incense. Uh, That is the, the altar of prayer where the prayers of the saints have gone and have been offered up as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Those prayers are depicted with the martyrs who cry out, How long, O Lord? And the saints on the earth who suffer under persecution for the gospel. It is a reminder to us that every prayer of every believer of every era is precious to the Lord and has an audience in heaven. Don't ever think that you've prayed as a believer and been alone in it. Heaven has heard. Heaven has felt. Heaven will act. And so this angel significantly comes out from that altar. And he's the one who, according to verse 18, has authority over fire. I believe this is probably the angel from chapter 8. Where fire is taken from this altar and cast down on the earth in some of those earlier judgments. And if that be the case, the, the answer to the prayers of the martyrs who long for vindication... Uh, The vindication of themselves and the vindication of the glory of God and the justice of God and the rightness of God will all come to play as answer to prayer. Verse 18 tells us, he called out with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. So the angel close to the prayers of beleaguered sufferers calls to the other angel to initiate this last phase of judgment. And he says, verse 18, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. The second harvest is not grain. It is grapes. 
And typically a sickle for vineyard work was a shorter sickle, not quite as long a pole. You didn't need the long pole to reach down to the ground. You have a shorter pole, but with the same sort of sharp curved edge that is designed to cut the branches of grapevines. It it severs the clusters from the vine so that the clusters can be gathered and carried to the wine press. And then he gives a reason. Again, it's, it's harvest time. The time has come, the angel says, because her grapes are ripe. And the word for ripe here in verse 18 is a different word than in verse 15. In verse 15, it was dry and withered. The grain had gone too far. But here the word for ripe is the the word for grapes in their prime, full of juice, ready to be squeezed. Read verse 19. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. In this graphic picture, the grapes are people. Jesus is the true vine. His people are called the fruit attached to him. But the beast has a vine too. Satan has a vine Those imitators have a vine and and their people are all the rebellious humanity who have taken the mark of the beast. They are to be gathered together for the final scene. And this gathering of clusters of grapes is a gathering of armies for war. The great war. The battle of Armageddon. This is a gathering of kings and armies, commanders and soldiers and slaves They will be gathered supernaturally. They will be gathered together by Satan and they will be gathered together by God. Look across the page at chapter 16 and verse 12. Again, this is looking forward to those bowl judgments. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up. So that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Then I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. They are spirits of demons doing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Satan's rage and humanity's rebellion and Antichrist's desperation will conspire to conscript the largest army the world has ever seen. They will be enticed by miracle working demons, no doubt convinced that they can win. This is a massive global deception to get all the armies to one place. And listen to what happens. They are thrown, verse 19, into the great wine press of the wrath of God. A wine press in the ancient world was two chambers cut out of solid rock, one of them lower than the other. In the upper chamber, the clusters of grapes would be placed, and workers would walk on the grapes, smashing the grapes down with their feet. So that the juice would run through the channel into the lower chamber. The feet of the grape smashers would be stained red with the juice from the ripe fruits. Their clothes would be stained from the spatter. The wine press described here is the geographic location for the final battle. The grapes are the mass of humanity gathered together to fight against Jesus And against the 144,000 who stand with him on Mount Zion when Jesus returns. No doubt the defenders of Jerusalem will appear small before the millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of combatants allied with the beast. Surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Never in the history of warfare will there have been such a vast army assembled. They will all surround one little city. They have mobilized from all over the world to demolish that city. 
and to finally defeat the last enemies of their corruptions. Jesus is an enemy to sinners who will not repent. They have made themselves at war with God and God is now at war with them. And these armies will have come to fight against Jesus himself. And notice again the verbiage from verse 19. It is the angel that swings the sickle, gathers the clusters, and throws them into the winepress of the wrath of God. Notice God's purpose here. In this cosmic chess game that they are destined to lose... They have marched their armies directly into the winepress of God's anger. And he is about to tread the grapes. Where is this winepress? I have a map for you up on the screen. Let's look at map one. On that screen, you have the Middle East. There are three red dots on the screen. Up at the top, you have the city of Megiddo. At the bottom, you have the town of Basra. And in the middle, you have Jerusalem. Those are the geographic parameters of this wine press. It's about a 180 mile stretch. And I'm going to read to you from the Old Testament prophets that give the geographic details of the wine press. Listen in Joel 3 verses 1 and 2. Behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there. Joel 3 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare a war. Rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Yahweh, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread the winepress is full. The vats overflow, their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. The stars lose their brightness. Yahweh roars from Zion. He utters his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth tremble. But Yahweh is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am Yahweh your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy. Listen to Isaiah 63. Who is this that comes from Edom and Basra? Basra is the town at the bottom of this map in the area of Edom, Idumea. It's modern day Jordan. Isaiah continues, why is your apparel red? Why are your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there is no man with me. I trod them in my anger, I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. I stained all my raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. My year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help. I was astonished and no one to uphold. So by my own arm, I brought salvation and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Zechariah 12, 8. In that day, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, 3, Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. Zephaniah 3, 8, therefore wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up as witness. Indeed, my decision 
is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Isaiah 34, 2. Yahweh's indignation is against all the nations, his wrath against all their armies. He utterly destroyed them. He gives them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Yahweh has a sacrifice in Basra, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Their land will be soaked with blood for Yahweh has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 15. From the mouth of Jesus comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and of commanders and mighty men and horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized And with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. From these Old Testament pictures, we understand that the armies will surround Jerusalem in this 180 mile swath. These vast armies from all over the world will make Jerusalem look small. The Lord Jesus will defend. Go to the next slide. We zoom out just a little bit. I want you to see where Israel is in the world. Israel sits at the conflux of three continents. Do you see it? Africa, Asia, Europe. To get from one to the other, you you go across this little patch of land that God has made the center of his rule, the capital of his people, the place where Jesus will rule the earth in his kingdom. It has also been the battleground of empires, Empires from North Africa and from Europe and from Asia have traipsed across this corridor. Israel has been in the crosshairs of the battles of empires its entire history. If Rome wanted to conquer Egypt, they went through Israel. If Babylon wanted to take over the world, they went through Israel. In fact, the battleground for this final war has been the battleground most traversed in wars. In fact, the city of Megiddo holds the record in world warfare for being the city most often conquered. And if you go there today, Har Megiddo, the the hill of Megiddo, it's a hill because the city was built on the rubble of the previous city and the previous city. And you have a hill there because of all the times it's been conquered and its people exterminated and replaced by another people. This is where it will all go down in the end. And in this map on the globe, I don't have my red dot pointer, but at the top of the Middle East, you've got Africa at the bottom, you've got Asia over to the right, Europe up to the top left, and in between the... Arabia, Arabian Peninsula, and there is a river across the top of it, which separates the East Asia from the Middle East. That is the Euphrates River. That is the river that Revelation 16 says will dry up to make way for all those armies to come right down into this land. 
They will all converge to surround the city of Jerusalem. Let's go to map two, the next slide. Jerusalem's a small place in all of this. You see it there next to the Sea of Galilee. It will be surrounded completely by the armies of the world. They will have the upper hand militarily. It was Napoleon who supposedly said that if there was any place in the world that he wanted to fight a battle, it was in this place. There's no better plane set up for armies to gather and fight a war. God will have assembled all the nation's armies for the purpose of their defeat. Satan wants this. The Antichrist wants this. The demon frogs go out and deceive the world to bring it about. No doubt the world itself wants to fight against the one barrier between the way they want to live And themselves, they will come and fight Jesus. But this is the day of God's wrath. And he's warned us about this wrath. It has been called throughout scripture, the wrath to come. John the Baptist warned us of this wrath to come. Matthew 3, 7, speaking to religious corrupt leadership. Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Paul warned of it in 1 Thessalonians 1. Jesus is the one who rescues believers from the wrath to come. Over and over again, Jesus gave warnings about this day. This day when God's wrath would come in its fullness to the earth. Can a ripe grape hold its juice together under the full weight of a human when he steps on it? No. The sea of hostile humanity gathered together into God's wine press will have no effective defense against the foot of Jesus as he spatters their blood on his garments. The false prophet who called down fire from heaven will simply be plucked up and thrown into the lake of fire. The beast that enforced his blasphemous schemes with the sword will have no defense against the one with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. He too will be unceremoniously plucked from the earth and tossed into eternal torment. And the largest army ever assembled will simply become a heap of corpses for the birds and a river of blood for the valley when Jesus Christ makes his victory. Look down at verse 20. And the wine press was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. The wine press is trodden outside the city. This is significant. This fulfills biblical promise. What the prophets referred to as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It was named so because Jehoshaphat uh, beat the Edomites in the Kidron Valley. This is the valley that runs right outside the the city proper of Jerusalem. It is a a deep ravine, a, a, a gully where many battles have happened in the past. The prophets call it the Valley of Jehoshaphat where God had victories before. They also called it the Valley of Decision, where God is making his decision, his judgment against the nations. Even the name Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. And here Jerusalem is defended. The battle happens outside the city precincts. Jerusalem, Zion is protected from this carnage. And you might be asking in the chronology, what what happened in Jerusalem? I thought Antichrist was in the temple. I thought that was his headquarters. I believe Antichrist's headquarters is in the rebuilt Babylon. He went into the temple to declare himself God and unify the world religiously around himself, committing the abomination of desolation that marked the midpoint of the tribulation. But something has happened where he's not there anymore. In fact, in this scene, Jesus is there and the 144,000 sealed Jewish evangelists are there with him in his victory. The prophets also tell us there are inhabitants of Jerusalem in need of defense. Some who couldn't flee, some who weren't protected, some remnant there still that Jesus will protect personally. We're not told how and when Antichrist left or how he was dislodged from Jerusalem. However, we do know that when Christ returns there, he will stand with his foot on the Mount of Olives. 
He will walk in in victory and protect his people. Verse 20 tells us blood came out from the winepress. This is not a final battle with a hard fought slog with casualties on both sides. How's this going to go? No, this will be a slaughter, a bloodbath, a one sided and total victory. The enemies of Christ have been brought there by their own blind rage, by demonic deception, by antichrist desperation, and by God's sovereignty to the place God has designed from all of history to stamp out human rebellion. The hostile armies will have marched themselves right into God's trap, the giant vat for the pressing of the grapes in wrath. And the text tells us that the blood went up to the horse's bridles, four to five feet deep. For 1600 stadia, that's, nobody knows exactly how big a stadia is, but estimates are around 180 to 184 miles long. That is precisely the dimensions given for us in the Old Testament prophets. From Megiddo and and the valley of Megiddo down to Basra, in Edom. Doesn't tell us how wide this blood river is, but the drainage from Megiddo flows down into the Jordan River Rift Valley, as does the drainage from all the other areas where the battle will take place. Let's go to map three. This is a picture, uh, or this is a, a Google Earth map of Megiddo. You see a a red dot down there at the bottom, uh, bottom left. And in between the the green area is this fertile valley full of agriculture to this day. Uh, It's very green. Israel has a, a climate similar to Southern California in some ways similar to Arizona. And yet there are places that get lots of water and just about anything can grow there. And this valley is, is very green, very verdant agricultural area. And Megiddo is on the bottom half of this area. The, in fact, the valley kind of looks like an arrowhead. It's kind of a triangle. This is, this is the place where the, the war will be. The, this is the valley of Armageddon. The Hebrew word har means hill, and it's the hill of Megiddo. This is where Armageddon is. Across that valley is another red dot on the map, and that red dot is Nazareth. I didn't know until I stood at Megiddo the proximity. I I didn't understand the geographical relationship. Uh, Let's go to the picture on the next slide. This is a picture I took from Nazareth. And it is a, you can see a steep hill. This is the opposite side of the valley of Jezreel, the the valley where God sows, sowing and reaping. These are the themes. The whole Bible has been pointing right to this arrowhead point geographically in the world to show us when this will all go down. And Nazareth is Jesus' boyhood home. This hill is likely the place where Jesus Hometown people tried to throw him off a cliff, tried to murder him. Of course, he escaped from their grasp. It wasn't his time. He wasn't going to die that way. Think about what it meant for Jesus to grow up in this town, to be despised by his own, and to overlook the Jezreel Valley, Where all the armies of the world will assemble against him in warfare. We don't like Jesus. We want to kill Jesus again. That's where he grew up. I don't know if you have fond memories from your childhood home. This was stunning to me. The, the, the day we stood here, we, we drove around to Mount Carmel. Uh, we went up on the hill where Elijah did battle with the prophets of Baal where God revealed his glory there. There's only one God. You better worship him or you're in a lot of trouble. And then we went around to the other side of the valley to the hill at Megiddo. And we stood there. And and I, I read these texts, Revelation 16, Revelation 19. 
And I didn't appreciate until we stood there looking across that valley where we had just been in Nazareth. (laughs) That's where Jesus grew up. And this is where it all ends. What does this say about the human heart? For all the warnings, for all the love, for all the grace, for all the mercy, for all the time given for people to repent, the world will not. The world will regather again, just like the Jewish mob in Jerusalem the first time cried out, crucify him. The world will gather with all of its armies, all of its implements. They will turn farming tools into weapons to try to kill Jesus again. The world's not getting better. The world will arm itself in totality against the Savior. Jesus knew all of this. In fact, Jesus is the only one who knew all of the wrath of God in its fullness. Jesus bore the wrath of God in all of its fullness. I want you to turn to Isaiah 53. And this song written of Christ 700 years before he came the first time gives a detailed depiction of his arrival, his truth, his suffering, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, his glorification, his intercession, his final victory. It's all here in prophecy before Christ was a baby at Bethlehem. We'll begin in verse 13 of chapter 12. Behold, my servant, speaking of Jesus, will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told of them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised. Forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore. Our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace fell upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter. Like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for his generation. Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. So his grave was assigned with a wicked man. Yet he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would place his soul as a guilt offering, he would see his seed. He would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will succeed in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. 
as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide with him a portion with the many. He will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death, was numbered with the transgressors. He himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Jesus knew the slaughter. Jesus knew what it was to be crushed under the infinite weight of holy justice. He's the only one who knows wrath in its fullness. No one ever has besides him. No one ever will besides him know wrath in its fullness. The only way that people under God's wrath and unbelief will know it is to do so for eternity and they will never finish knowing it. Jesus knew it all in his substitutionary death in the place of sinners. The one whose garments will be stained with the blood of his enemies is the one whose garments were stripped in shame because he loved his enemies. The one whose blood was spilt to secure life for all who would believe is the one who is just to judge the world and avenge his own righteous name. The one who justified the many and assuaged his father's wrath against them. He is the one who is judged as though he had sinned. Jesus is the only one who has ever known the fullness of the wrath of God. Has endured eternity's punishment for crimes that were not his own. So that we could live. It is not yet harvest time for the reaper of the earth. But that time is soon. And he will come. Are you ready? Lord Jesus, we love you. So poorly, so distractedly. But when we think about what is coming to this world, what this world deserves, we, we must think about what we deserve, each one of us. And what we would get if you had not been merciful. And we thank you all over again for your kindness to us. You went to the cross to pay for the sins of all who would believe the gospel. I pray for any here this morning who have not yet believed. Lord, we know and you know that they will believe one day, but not in a saving way, if they hold out. Would you be pleased to bring sinners to saving faith? To avoid the wrath that is to come, to be safe and secure in you. You are our only hope. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would come quickly, but not until you have saved everyone for whom your blood was spilt. Make us missionaries, representatives, ambassadors of that good news. It's in your name we pray. Amen.